You're listening to Pole Parlor, a fun, inspiring podcast for all those bewitched by pole dance. Each week, your Madam Crimson Minx has candid conversation with unique, engaging individuals from within and around the pole dance community. Pole Parlor is passionate about preaching creativity, soulful sensuality, and empowerment through pole dance. You know how we do. Welcome everyone to Pole Parlor. This is episode 34, Natasha Wong. I'm your host, Crimson Minx. This week on the podcast, we have pole star and pioneer Natasha Wong. On this episode, we talk about how Natasha transitioned from hating exercise and having stage fright into being a professional athlete and stage performer, how pole has evolved from when she started in its early days 11 years ago, and we also get some fun stories about her experiences traveling around the world as a full-time pole dancer. Don't forget to check out Natasha's post-podcast interview on the blog at poleparlor.com where she shares her favorite photos, music, video, and more. And don't miss the fun on social media. Search at Pole Parlor on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Pinterest, and Spotify. It would be my honor to connect with you there as well. All right, shameless plugs over. Let's bring on Natasha. Natasha Wong to the Pole Parlor Podcast. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Oh my goodness. So happy to have you here with me. So let's jump right on in. First question we ask everyone, for how long have you been pole dancing and how did you first discover pole? Um, I've been pole dancing for 11 years and I started at S Factor in Los Angeles and I was there for about three and a half or four and a half years. I was there for a while. Um, obviously back then there was no pole community. There was the, yeah, the, the, I think there was Sheila Kelly studio in Los Angeles and there was Fanya studio in Vegas. And I think maybe Bobby's was around at that time, but back then it was like the dark ages of pole. Um, and I started there going once a week and then eventually started going twice a week. And then I went to B spun and then the rest is history. So, yeah. Um, some of my favorite dancers are from S Factor. <laughs> yeah. Well, one, probably because it was just one of the earliest studios, but I love how I think people come out of that studio like really in, in, in touch with their movement and things. So mm-hmm. um, were you a dancer before that? Were you an athlete before that? or uh, I was neither oh. athlete nor dancer <laughs> nor oh. fan of movement in general. Um, I didn't. I, I was, I went to raves and clubs. So that was like the extent of my movement vocabulary. Um, I did play volleyball in junior high and high school, but I was a bench warmer and spent most of the game sitting on the bench because every time the coach would bring me into the game, I would just completely fuck up. <laughs> and yeah, so it, I, that actually developed, um, a fear of, exercise for me. So when I quit the team in high school, I decided I was never going back. I was never exercising again. I was fortunately thin, so I felt like I didn't need to. And so I didn't exercise from the age of 18 until 29. Oh my gosh. The irony of that. Yeah. (laughs) Of that just becoming what you do. Yeah. What were you doing at this time when you were just starting to pull? Um, I was a publicist for about nine years. So I was working in a, a little PR company in Santa Monica. Um, and one of the reasons why I did start taking classes was because you know, I was getting close to the age of 30 um, of smoking and drinking and living not the healthiest lifestyle. And so I felt like if I didn't make a change now, it was just it was never going to happen. So um, a girlfriend uh, saw S Factor on Oprah and invited me to come to an intro class. And I think I stuck with it because I didn't hate it. Um, I tried like yoga in the past. I tried belly dancing and just kind of dabbled with stuff in college and I hated everything. So I, I would take one class and just give up. So I didn't hate it, um, which was good. And so I just stuck with it. So what was that journey like then from publicist to now 
you know, to becoming a professional puller? Because obviously that wasn't something that you set out to do originally. Yeah. Well, I think the funny thing was, is like back then when I first started, there was no concept of pole stars. Um, I don't think, I think the first, the first people to really sort of tour uh, internationally and teach workshops were, you know, Janine and Alethea. Um, I took my, I think my first workshop ever was from Sarah Creedle. I don't know if you remember her. She's Miss Sexy. She, yeah. yeah. She, she did a, the handspring or she yeah. it with creating the handspring. Exactly. And then I think my second workshop with, was with Badass. Yeah. So Josiah was teaching workshops back then. But when I started, there was no, like, there was no idea of like, I'm going to continue taking pole classes. I'm going to start competing and then I'm going to tour and make money teaching workshops. So no one doing pole at the time had those aspirations, which was kind of nice because you just did it for the love of the movement, not with this end goal in mind. You know, there wasn't even an end goal of like getting a fondy or getting a handspring because there was, we, we didn't have those moves back then. Wow. So, um, but, uh, anyways, I'm digressing the, uh, the transition from being a publicist to pole. I mean, there was many years of overlap. Um, I didn't quit my job until, I think I quit my job in 2011. So it's been almost, I guess, five and a half years. Um, so I was doing poll, um, starting to compete, and then working my job as a publicist. And for the most part, trying to keep those two worlds separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was kind of a struggle. <laughs> yeah, because I think a lot of people deal with that. Like, what, it, what are my professional... Uh, contacts gonna what is their reaction gonna be and this yeah as a publicist you're probably a bit more cognizant of that than maybe other people yeah <laughs> well it's weird though because you know there's a lot of dialogue in the poll community um about you know being proud of of doing poll and not being ashamed of it because once you assign shame to um to poll then that's in a way denigrating pole dancing yeah um, and, um, and so I remember I did an interview years and years ago and where I kind of said the same thing that I had to keep those two worlds separate. And there was a, a commenter on YouTube that said something like, you know, sh she's not a very good ambassador for the sport because she's ashamed of being a pole dancer. You know, she should be proud and, and be open about it. And, you know, but when you are working professionally, you do have to consider these things. Unfortunately, you just kind of have to. <laughs> It's a reality. It really it's a reality. is, you know, yeah. and like, it's kind of like, you know, obviously you're a great ambassador and like you kind of, it's, you know, some people start and they just start posting things right away and tell everyone and have that freedom. But for other people, you know, they may just not be in that position and, you know, I yeah. respect that, but you can't, yeah. you know, it's nice. You see like smaller steps, you know, right. and well, yeah. they just start telling people first. And yeah. <laughs> Well, I think also because I was older and, you know, like when I first started, there was not, um, you know, I, I, the Facebook wasn't even around, you know, so there wasn't the, the sort of social media generation where you are sharing your whole world online, True. you know, cause like when I started, it was 2000, 2006. Okay. Um, and it, you know, like, <laughs> so I think when you're a little bit older, you're just a little bit more private. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense because, yeah. uh, um, you know, a lot of people do um, cite you as inspiration um, for them because you started when you were, quote unquote, old, 29, ancient. Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. But, you know, for a sport, you know, to become yeah. top of the top of their game, like you've become and just not start until 29 and to just be like not even working out <laughs> for 11 years prior and you know so that's like a huge accomplishment and so but do you think maybe like you can attribute your success to starting when you were older like and do you even think someone I sourced some questions from the Facebook group and people were even wondering like do you think that you're having worked so long as a publicist actually helped you um yeah. Well, I think, I think definitely being older. So kind of going back to the comment I was saying about like, you know, the, the social media generation, like the younger generation of people who like share everything online. Mm -hmm. I think when you get older, you, there's no longer this desire to be 
the sexiest girl in the group or, you know, there's like, you kind of lose that sort of competitiveness that when you're younger, you have with other women. And so I think when you become older, you're a little bit more confident in your movement. You're not, you're not putting on heels and wearing a sexy outfit to please other men. You're doing it for yourself. And so I think, um, what I find incredibly sexy about seeing women who are a little bit older pole dance because is because you can tell that they're just they're moving because it feels good to them and they feel sexy inside. They could give a shit about whether other people think it's sexy, you know? Yeah. So um, I think uh, definitely when you get older, you, you, you pull dance for yourself a little bit more. Um, in terms of whether it helped as a publicist, well, yeah, I mean, obviously I think working, um, you know, for, for nine years, you, you, um, you learn discipline. Um, so I think definitely when I was starting training for competitions, you know, it was, it was a pretty focused way of training. Um, I think especially because I was working during the day and I had a limited time at night to prepare for USPDF or whatever, um, that when I was at the studio, I was like, all right, I'm not fucking around. I have two hours that I'm paying money for. I have two hours to get shit done and I'm going to focus and not be on my phone, not be text messaging people. Um, so I think definitely it helped me just kind of stay focused. Um, that makes sense. I think there's like, um, this misconception that, you know, if you want to kind of get to a a high level that you have to kind of like quit everything and just focus on that completely. And that's like, not the reality. It seems like with everyone we've talked to on the podcast, Mm -hmm. it's like, it's balancing your real life with the training and competing and the performing until you can kind of get to a point where maybe that's a possibility. (laughs) Yeah. And I also think that the, it's almost like the more stimulus you have in your life, the more creative stimulus you have, the more like mental stimulus I have, it actually like helps you, be more creative and more focused. Um, and I definitely found that true when I quit my job in PR just to focus on poll. Um, the first couple of months was really difficult because I had all of this time during my day to do whatever I wanted. And like, I'd be at the studio for like six hours and go home and be like, I didn't do anything today, you know? And I'd come home, I'd sit in front of the TV and watch a movie. And then like, two weeks would go by and I'm like, what have I done? That's been productive. (laughs) Nothing because I just lost focus. Whereas like, you know, if I wake up and I have, okay, I'm going to do my two hour training in the morning, which is what I've been doing lately. I'm going to come home. I'm going to work at my desk on expert stuff and tour stuff and then go back to the studio at night or whatever. You know, when I have a schedule, it's so much easier to be focused and productive. Yeah, that makes sense because, um, having, I think, you know, think about when we were in school back in the day, it was like, oh, I have to get this paper done tomorrow. You know, that, yeah. wow, like you get, you get it done, but get when it done. it's like you have this paper do- due in two weeks, you're like, ah, right. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's kind of like, I only have two hours to do this. So, yeah. you know, to do this choreography, it's going to get done in this time. So right. that makes sense. So like, yeah. how long did it take you to really get to um like the flexibility and the strength is it something that came to you quickly once you started or was it um would you say that was kind of a slower process for you well I think it was probably well you know I mean for somebody who has a background in fitness who's been running or doing crossfit or gymnastics or whatever obviously that's going to come a lot quicker than it did for me um I actually was the other day watching a video from my very first competition when I did California pole dance championships in 2009. And at that point I'd been pole dancing for, I think five years. Mm -hmm. And I was like looking at my body and I could, I could barely recognize myself, you know? And I was like, you know, I was like kicking up into handsprings and doing elbow grip Aisha's and doing drop splits and that, you know, the stuff that was advanced at the time. But, um, like my body didn't, I didn't have the body of an athlete or, you know, somebody who like worked out mm-hmm. at all, even after five years of doing pole. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know. My, my dad was a martial artist and he was a competitive martial artist, um, when he was my age and he still travels and teaches workshops and judges, uh, tournaments. And he's very active in the martial arts community. 
Um, so I think growing up around that and probably just seeing him, I'm sure it helped. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure having his genes helped. <laughs> <laughs> so he used to stretch me when I was a kid. And um, so, you know, I had my splits when I was young. But Okay. But, you know. You still have to work hard. I, I still have to work at it, of course. So then your parents were, you know, and, you know, family and friends, because of maybe what your dad, um, his career is, were they cool with you, like, going, like, I'm going to do this pole thing full time and uh, and leaving the the corporate career? Did they totally understand it then? Well, you know, I think when you have a Chinese family, <laughs> no, they were not that cool. I mean, they were they were cool with it, but they were concerned uh-huh. for the obvious reasons, you know, course, like yeah. when you're leaving stability um, and you've got, you know, retirement plan and your insurance is paid for, you know, those are nice things when you have a regular paycheck. And when you're entering this mysterious world where you're, you know, like you don't know when you're going to be, you know, working again, or you have to pay for your own insurance or, you know, it's, it's a scary prospect, I think for any parent. Um, but, uh, I didn't tell, well, in terms of like competing and doing pole, I didn't tell my parents, um, that I was doing pole until after I started winning competitions. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So, uh, I just never got around to it. (laughs) Was it fear of the stigma thing? Yeah, it was kind of fear of like how I was going to explain it. Um, And, you know, like this was 2010. So it was a little bit of a different world then. You didn't really see pole fitness on TV or pole fitness on America's Got Talent, you know, so. Yeah, Yeah, you couldn't like point to people and say. Look, exactly. Like, they're doing this. This is kind of the path that I'm choosing to take or like, you know, right. see see all these competition videos circulating all over social media it was kind of right. forging that. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. They just figured like our daughter moved to Los Angeles and is <laughs> <laughs> now dancing on a pole. What? Right. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, but I think it was, it was not necessarily that I was like ashamed of it, you know, cause I was already, you know, in my thirties. So like clearly like, you know, I do whatever the hell I want. I'm an adult, but it was more just like, just never really found the right opportunity to say something until I started winning stuff. And then I was like, Oh, I should probably tell them cause they might be proud, yeah. you know? Yeah. And they are, I assume. Oh yeah. They're so proud. Aww. Yeah. Yeah. They share my videos and like my videos. It's really cute. That's amazing. See? (laughs) Now, you were talking before. You said, like, something like, oh, that's my training now. You said TR. What's your training now? Because you start, you briefly put it in there before something that you're doing training now and I didn't catch it because I don't think I know what it is. (laughs) Oh, oh, no. I, I, um, I was just saying that I, um, right now my schedule, because, uh, you know, because I just started this company Xper, um, I'm working from home in the afternoons Uh and then I get up early, like I get up at seven 30 and I go to beast bun and I train there for like two hours Okay. every morning. Yeah. So that's just, yeah, I was going to ask like you're, so you're still training pole. What is that? So you train pole every day. Yeah. (laughs) Well, like five, six days a week. Oh, that's all. Yeah. Nice. yeah. I, I used to, I used to train more. Like I would, I was one of those people would be like, I'm at the studio for f- five hours and then I go take my cardio class and I'm taking my stretch class and then I'm going to yoga. And then, you know, I was like, my whole day was filled, but I'm too busy right now to, to just yeah. do that anymore. So that's so funny. You went from literally hating exercise to doing multiple forms a day. So do you still do like stretch classes or yoga or anything like that ancillary now or? Normally, yes. Uh, but since I got back from my last tour, I've, I've been too focused on launching Xper. So I haven't been training as much as I usually do. Yeah. Yeah. We have to talk about Xper. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to leave it for later on, but now that we keep bringing it up. Sorry. No. It's consuming my life right now. No, that's so cool. More work than you would think it would be making cat scratching posts. (laughs) Yeah. For those who don't know what Xper is, please (sighs) tell tell us what it is and and how long you've been working on it. 
Um, so Xper is a cat accessories and toy company that merges the world of pole fitness and cats. <laughs> 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 so we, um, we've been working on it since July. Okay. Um, and it was actually like a really fast ramp up because we wanted to make a splash at Pole Expo and kind of like start our Kickstarter at Pole Expo. Um, our Kickstarter just ended about two weeks ago. Okay. So ever since then, we're just trying to, we're starting production, um, you know, like, uh, try to get things made as inexpensively as possible because right now um, it's very expensive. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, like a scratching post. It's yeah. That looks like a pull. I can't wait. I, I don't know how, first of all, I missed this Kickstarter because <laughs> this is something that is exactly what I would want. So uh, Pussifer, my cat, is definitely getting one when they go for yeah. sale to the public. And so it's like... It looks like a stage pole, but it's a scratching yeah. post. Yeah, yeah. So what else is there? So we have a pole cleaner, um, which is a catnip spray. <laughs> um, so you spray it on the pole. You don't really clean it, obviously, because you just leave it in there. Yeah. Um, but we have we have some other stuff coming down the line. Um, that basically is just like cat toys for pole dancers who have cats, or for non pole dancers who like you know, who appreciate cat toys with a sense of humor, I guess. Oh, so I can't yeah. Wait. Yeah. It's been really fun. Yeah. That's super different. Cause I've, t we've talked to people on the podcast before about like, how are you producing your like line of pole wear and things like that, or, and even producing poles, but we've never talked about cat toys yeah. accessories are you doing it like locally is this something where you have to like travel overseas to get it produced or no we're we're not doing the overseas production route because it's a you can't really do a lot of quality control okay. and b you know when you're when you're producing something that is for your pet you don't want weird chemicals and like we hand dye the sisal rope so that it looks like chrome and we have to use a special dye that's animal friendly and non-toxic. And so like, we want to make sure that it's not, you know, going to yeah. kill your cat. If a bunch of pole cats die. That would be awful. That would be really <laughs> that, bad. That's a PR nightmare, but. That would be really bad. Yeah. Yeah. So who's we, by the way? So my partner, Arlo Rustin, and I, um, she's also a competitive pole dancer. She's, she teaches. Um, she actually just, I think she's now one of the people behind pole moves. So training program. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. So fellow cat lady pole dancer. So fun. So I'm going to put the link to this in the show notes so people can follow and hopefully will these be out by Christmas? So we're the Kickstarter orders are shipping starting in, starting around like the beginning of December. So like the, we have a, an, like an early bird mm -hmm. ship. Like, you know how Kickstarter works, yes. right? Yes. So, yeah. So, people who pledged on Kickstarter, which basically, like, helps fund the company. Um, so, people who fl who pledged, I think it was, like, $59, will actually get the X per poll. And they'll get it in time for Christmas. Um, and then there's another shipment going out in March. Um, but we're hoping to get everything up by March. Like, our website's going to be up in March. Like, the other merch that we have for sale is going to be up in March. And then we're just going to start production on the, the next stuff we have in our, in our line. I feel like that's really fast. I don't know. In my head, that timeline is really quick. So yeah, yeah. It's kind of scary. Yeah. yeah. Kind of scary, but fun. Yeah. So, you know, you were just like, I love cats. I love pole. Let's do this. Like, yeah. let's figure this out. <laughs> well, the funny thing was, so we were at cat convention so there's a cat convention and it's massive um i think there were like i think there were like fifteen thousand people who went something like that um but arlo and i went to cat convention and we saw this woman who was selling this yoga mat for cats and it's just a mini yoga mat with like a little toggle at the top and then a cat toy hanging from it and the idea was like you know you're at home trying to get your yoga practice in and your cat's crawling all over you yeah. And, like, you've seen the YouTube videos, I'm sure, yes. of, like, people doing yoga and the cats are all over them. And I was like, same thing happens for pole dancers. You're pulling at home and your cat's, like, trying to, you know, bat at your hair while you're upside down. And, and then I was like, we need to do a cat scratching pose that looks like a pole. 
So, <laughs> yeah. And then within a week, really? we had a prototype, and yeah, wow. it's fun. You know, it's not going to change the world, but it's really fun. Oh well, you know, not <laughs> everything we do. Sometimes it's just like feeding that creativity and that like right. you know fun aspect of your life. Yeah. So that's taking up a lot of your time, as you said. You're training in the morning. Like, what else, you know, obviously, um, you are very busy being a quote-unquote pole star, but, like, what's that look like? What's, like, a day or a week or a year? Like, how much are you traveling? Uh, Well, last year I was traveling, I think we did the calculations, and it was around 70% of the year. It's a lot. It's a lot. lot. So when I'm home, this is, like, me time. Um, In the past, when I've been home, it's just, like, I I train. I kind of, like, focus on catching up on all the movement that's come out since I was on tour, Um, spending time with my fiancé, spending time with my cats. Um, But, like, there's no like typical day because, you know, I'm, I'm in town and then I leave again for a month and then I'm back for a couple of weeks. I have a long stretch actually coming up this year, which is nice. Um, so I'm kind of like slowing it down a little bit, focusing on some other projects. Maybe a child is in the future. Ooh. Fingers <laughs> um, crossed. Or fingers yes. crossed. Well, you know, we're not trying yet. Well, this is, this is getting really personal. But uh, yeah. anyways, so yeah, maybe, maybe sometime. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, that's a very exciting. We're all going to keep our, um, our stilettos crossed for you. <laughs> and, um, but it does, it sounds like your typical day is traveling. Like that's your typical day is not when you're at home catching up on things. It's when you're on the road since yeah. that's 70% of your time. Yeah. So yeah, you're traveling for workshops, you're mm-hmm. competing, you're performing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, judging a lot of competitions. Last, oh, okay. last September, I judged, I think it was four or five competitions in one month. I judged a competition in Hong Kong. I judged PCS in Hong Kong. And then I went to flew to Costa Rica to perform in a show. And then I went to Vegas for PolCon. Um, and then I went to judge oh then I went to Mallorca to judge pole arts Spain then I judged the northeast pole championships and then USPDF that's like five right in one month that was six like I that. think we're at six. five or six that's or, yeah anyways so I judged a lot of competitions in September yeah Wow. And so like, what's the incentive for you to go judge a competition other than obviously like you get to see some rad competitions. Are, are you able to then like teach workshops while you're there or? Yeah, usually, usually we teach workshops with competitions, but, um, but I, that's, you know, usually the reason I decide to go is yes to, to see all the amazing athletes. I mean, for me, it's like, it's, it, uh, because I don't spend a lot of time. I, I should spend more time, but I don't spend a lot of time like researching, um, watching YouTube videos, watching Instagram videos of other of other people. I'm starting to be better about it while I'm back home. But um, it's a great opportunity when you're judging competitions just to see the latest tricks and see the the new faces that are coming out. There's so much talent, um, and then just for it to be a reunion with old friends, like after pull art. Spain, uh, Shayna, Sam Starr, Andrea Reif, and Honka, and I just like spent two days at the beach. It was amazing. So yeah, it's spending time with friends and seeing the world, of course. Yeah. What are the competitions like over in, you know, Europe? Because I've never been seen pole outside of the U.S. Is oh really? No. Yeah. It's it's on the list of things, but (laughs) (laughs) are they? Um. How do they compare? Would you say? And like, can you like name some of the competitions that you just like feel are superior? Since it seems like you've probably been to everything at least once. Um. Well, I think the the there's different pole art competitions, and they're all independently run, but. Um, but they, um, they're massive. I think when I judged pole art Italy, we judged from, I think it was like starting at 2 PM and we didn't end until 3 AM. Oh my gosh. The last competitor went on at like 2 30 in the morning. We judged, I think in two days, 160 competitors. 
Oh, it's wow. crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. That's intense. Is that um, just because there's not a lot of other competitions around there? So that's just the one people are entering so they can perform? No, or there's just... so many. Wow. Like in Europe, there's pole art Spain, pole art Italy, pole art Croatia, pole art Greece, pole art Switzerland, pole art France. There's, there's pole art Cyprus, which is happening this upcoming weekend. There's so many. There's like a competition every weekend. I don't know. In, in Europe, it's probably the proximity of the countries um, to each other and, and the, um, the ease at which people can travel in Europe. Um, I think a lot of the countries there are, um, you know, they, they have the money and disposable income to be able to travel. Um, but, yeah, uh, there's, the competition scene in Europe is crazy. Okay, yeah. well, I'm going to have to make it over there. I'm sure mm. like, a lot of listeners are are interested. So mm. do you have any, like, fun anecdotal stories to share with us in some of your travels? I mean, anything interesting or fun or just weird happen in any of your <laughs> travel experiences? Um, you know, I last spring in, I think it was March or April, I taught at the Dubai pole camp, um, and then from Dubai, I flew to Israel and taught in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv, and I think in terms of eye-opening cultural experiences, like, that is way, way at the top of my list. Wow. Like, it was such an amazing experience. Um, when I was in Dubai, I had students who were from Lebanon and Iran and Oman and Egypt, um, and maybe some other Middle Eastern countries. Um, but like to be in a country, uh, Dubai is, I wouldn't say Dubai is progressive, but it's very Westernized in the sense that there's a lot of Western expats who live there. Um, a lot of Russians, a lot of Europeans, a lot of Americans. So you do see Westerners walking around, um, but it's also a country that is um, very religious and has a lot of rules in place <laughs> um, that you would expect from a Muslim country. Um, so it's really interesting to be in that part of the world and meet other pole dancers who are like they walk inside the studio and some of them walk in wearing, you know, the coverings and they walk into the studio, they take it all off, they're wearing tiny little rad pull shorts, you know, <laughs> and they put on their heels and they're super sexy and really in touch with themselves and really confident with their bodies and their sexuality. Oh, wow. And then they put their coverings back on and go back out into the world, you know? So, like... To be somewhere where, like, the pole studio is, like, the safe haven of personal, artistic, and sensual expression for these women is so amazing to see. Um, and Israel was kind of similar, too, um, where I was teaching at a studio in Jerusalem, and um, there were um, uh, there were Jewish students, and then there were Muslim students inside the studio, and, you know, it really, it's kind of hokey, but it really is a concept that like when everyone takes off their clothes, everyone looks exactly the same, you know, the Muslims and Jews look exactly the same. And so like, uh, you know, differences sometimes don't apply inside a pole studio and that's, you know, pole brings everyone together. So yeah. that was, that was probably the highlight I think of my teaching career was going to those two countries. Oh, wow. No, that's really cool. And it's interesting to see how like pole can technically be like a microcosm of like greater society. Yeah. And it was not hokey. I really liked that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you said that we had um, Joy G. Wild on a few weeks ago and she opened the first pole studio in Istanbul. And so she was oh. telling us a little bit about that as well and how like you know, I'm thinking, wow, we have a struggle. I think I have a struggle in Los Angeles, but you know, <laughs> imagine being in like a Muslim country and you know, yeah. the fight's a bit tough, tougher there, but it sounds like they probably like appreciate that, that safe haven mm -hmm. even more than say like, yes. I just would even be capable of, of appreciating. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. You think about all these things that like as pole dancers in Western societies, we take for granted, you know, like that, you know, we, we can pole dance and put our videos out there and be proud of what we do. Um, sure. There's a little bit of a social stigma that's, you know, always going to exist a little bit. Um, but it's nothing like some of the pressures that some other women in different parts of the world face, you know, and they do it anyways because they love it and it makes them feel good. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. And like, you know, there's kind of hope that in a way maybe pole is helping to push those boundaries and as more women find the safe haven to participate yes. and to, you know, be able to appreciate themselves on that level that, you know, boundaries will slowly push out. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Pole has the ability to do that. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, so you um, you teach. You were um, performance artist of the year. You were instructor of the year. You've obviously won so many competitions. Now that you've been doing it for so long, is there one that you're like, mm, I really, this is kind of, if I have to settle on, on one direction, this is what I want to do? Do you prefer teaching over performing? Would you just love to just perform? Or are you like a competitive type that you just want to like get more titles? Or <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I love teaching. Okay. I love teaching. And, you know, like I love competing too, but I'm, I've never been um, the sort of person that loved having the spotlight on them. Okay. I grew up quite shy and, uh, and I actually started competing and performing to get over stage fright. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I did spend, I spent a month in China, uh, touring and performing as a featured performer in clubs. And then I spent one month in Macau performing at China Rouge. Um, a couple of other pole dancers did the same, like Anastasia Shukdorova did it with Yevgeny and, uh, Sean Michael. China Rouge. It's a, it's a VIP club inside one of the big hotel casinos, in in Macau Mm -hmm. an island off of Hong Kong and so every night I performed my two sets and I loved it like it was really amazing to like get into the flow of performing every night um, because you get to the point where uh, you don't even get nervous anymore like it's such an automatic thing you're like this is just what I do I go out on stage in front of you know 100 people and I do my pole act and it's just what I do you know so um you're able to quiet that voice that's usually in the back of my head when I go on stage that says, you're going to fuck everything up. (laughs) You're going to forget your pole passes, you know, like it was really nice. And I came home from Macau. This was about two years ago. I came home and I was like, I want to do more performances. And then I started teaching again. And then I was like, no, I'm just going to focus on teaching. (laughs) (laughs) Like I'm too old to be performing no that's not true we want to still see you perform please (laughs) Uh, yeah so what was the reaction by the way to to your performances over there you said in China when you were doing clubs and and whatnot is there appreciation for pole as an art uh yeah well when I was there um I did a one month tour of China with uh do you know Laura Martin Flying Laura so she's based in San Diego. She's one of like the early pioneers of cool. pole. Like she's famous for like the the inside like like the flying Scorpios. Like she was like one of the first people to do those crazy leg hang switches and yeah. she's amazing. You should look her up. Um sure. so we were um I, I want to say we were the first western pole dancers to perform in China. Yeah. Or like one of the first. So we spent one month going all over China, every you know, every couple of days we're in a new city performing in different clubs. And we were on a TV show there um, that is the was the number one TV show in China at the time, which if you are on a number one TV show in China, <laughs> that means there are like a billion people watching you. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Like if you want to be famous, go on TV in China and you will get <laughs> gazillion eyeballs on you. Um, so when we were touring at the time, this was in 2012, um, poll was still kind of just starting in China. Um, I remember at the time going to a couple of pole studios to train and, you know, the level was not that high and they were doing a lot of, you know, like copying moves that they saw 
other people online do and sort of reproducing them. There wasn't a lot of like creativity and like movement exploration, at least back in 2011 time, yeah. or 2012. And, um, and in China, Facebook and YouTube are not allowed. And so that limits a lot of the Chinese pole dancers in what they're able to see of the outside world. So they don't get a lot of, um, yeah, they're, they're, they don't have a lot of access to the pole fitness world. Um, now, like fast forward four years later, five years later, and like there are so many amazing Chinese athletes around right now. Like, I don't know if you've been following this guy, Coco Kihong. No. He is amazing. Add him to the list. Um, you have to add him to the list. <laughs> um, there's also this guy, China Boy Jeremy, who is also <laughs> ridiculous. Um, I don't know why, like, the men in China are, are kind of like the more famous ones. Because um, I, I can't name a female Chinese pole dancer, which is really bad. But, um, but yeah, so now, Fair like. Enough. Yeah, I think soon enough you're going to, like, have to keep an eye out for pole dancers coming out of China because they're ridiculous. It's growing so fast. Growing so fast. And they have a huge population to pull from, so. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So oh. they can just pluck the best of the best out of their billion or so people. Yeah, I mean, that's cool, though, that, like, even in the countries where it's been the most resistance, even now we're seeing, like, finally – it's taking off like, yeah. you know, in the Muslim countries and in like, you know, Chinese culture that's, you know, shut off more and who knows where else next. I think that, mm -hmm. you know, this point you started 11 years ago and I just think 11 years from now, it's going to, you know, someone's going to come back and listen to this interview and be like, you can't name a Chinese po woman po yeah. or like you couldn't like tell people at work what you were doing. It's just, right. you know. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's changed so much. It changes year to year so much. It's crazy. And you're one of the few people that is able to say that you've really seen most of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Which is really cool. Like, it's funny yeah. that you have so many, even like that, you like your stories. You did initially come out with like the story of China, which is like would be like the highlight of Selvin's life. But you've done so many things within the pole community that like, you know, nothing just pops out as being like a major, um, a major highlight for you when it would be a total major highlight for anyone <laughs> else in their life. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's been amazing. I've had a really good, actually, I was thinking the other day, I was talking to my fiance and remembering this, uh, this happened really early in my pole career. Um, and it's definitely one of the highlights. One of the most fun I ever had was, um, after I won USPDF, do you know Angel Dust? I've heard the name. A, yeah. Um, uh, I think her real name, she's going to hate me for saying this, is Glenice Braithwaite, Brathwaite, um, which I think on her Facebook profile, she had to change it from Angel Dust to back to her real name. Mm -hmm. But she um, produces California Pole Dance Championships and um, Napa mm -hmm. National Air Pole Art. Uh, yeah. yeah. So she's the producer. And she's like one of the early like pioneers of pole. Um in 2011, she contacted me and Amy Guyon from, you know, Amy, Amy Guyon from yeah, PSO. she's been on the podcast. Yeah. Yep. So she contacted me and Amy um, and said, hey, um, I got contacted by this artist to do a show in uh, Greece for two weeks. Um, you're going to be performing pole as part of uh, this interactive art show. Um, on a ship in the middle of the ocean and we're going to go to the island of Hydra and then we're going to be docked there and you guys are going to perform every night and so we spent two weeks in Greece with uh, do you know Chloe Sevigny the actress yes so she was the star of this show um she we had just getting more and more bizarre it was, uh, <laughs> what was Chloe was a, Sevigny doing there okay yeah so there was a there was a, a like a, a noise band that's based in LA and um Chloe Sevigny and there was a guy who was like a rodeo guy who like specialized in <laughs> cowboy whips um and then there were like R&B singers and we just did this random show for this, this is trippy as hell it, by the it way. was amazing it was called Black Mirror okay look it up yeah yeah if I can find videos, I'll put them in the show note. There may not be any. I don't know if you know if there's any. If you go to, I think if you look up Black Mirror, um, you will find 
a video on the artist's website. Okay. Because this is, you know, these are the things that when we, we talk about this on the podcast all the time, how like, how can we get pull out there in a way that would appeal to non-pullers? And mm-hmm. like, this is a, a great example mm-hmm. of that. Like, put it on a cruise ship in Greece in the middle of the ocean with Chloe Svigny and a, um, a, a noise band and some r and <laughs> artists <Yeah. laughs> and a, a rodeo whip guy. Like, that's, that's not creative. I don't know what is. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. So that was definitely, I think that, that, was, was, that was one of the highlights. Yeah. And, two and to be with Angel and Amy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Amy yeah. didn't tell us this on the podcast. The <laughs> <laughs> you have to do a follow-up interview. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. That's really cool. Yeah. It just seems like, you know, Paul has afforded you so many more experiences than, you know, being a publicist would have, you know, mm-hmm. and life takes really funny turns sometimes. You were proof it, of that. Yeah, yeah. Someone it who really hates, scared of performing and hates exercising. Yeah. Who was scared of heights and, <laughs> yep, was very lazy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I ended up here, but, yeah. It's meant to be. Yeah. So what's your trajectory moving forward? We kind of touched on it a bit earlier, but where do you see yourself heading now? Because since, you know, you've accomplished so much up to this point. Well, um, that's a really good question. Um, I think I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to continue traveling every once in a while, but hopefully try to slow that down just a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe in the future, in the near future, because I'm turning 41 November 6th. Oh, happy almost birthday. Thank you. Um, maybe pretty soon, you know, thinking about having a family and that sort of stuff. Um, and then continue to grow expert. Yeah. Um, which has been really fun. So yeah. Um, all good stuff. Is your husband in the pole world at all or athletic or anything like that? Or? Oh, okay. No. I'm just curious. Cause I was like, what kind of super child are you creating? <laughs> <laughs> he's, um, he's a DJ. Oh, cool. uh, so he's an electronic musician, oh, um, good. but was an attorney for nine years and left law about seven years ago to be a musician. Um, but I think he's going to be going back to law also. Um, so yeah, we've both, we've both been very lucky that we've been able to pursue our artistic dreams for as long as we have. Yeah. It sounds like it. Good for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So let's transition into the second part of the interview. And these are questions that I ask everyone who's on the podcast. So Um, question number one, who is Natasha Wong's pole crush? I think it will always be Marlo Fiskin. Mm, Always. And it's, I I bet she hates it when like other people say, because I think she's, she's, you know, I don't think she likes the fawning, but like, I can't help but fawn over her. Well, you're a lot of people's on the podcast have mentioned you. So I hope it doesn't, if you're not offended, I don't see why she would be offended. (laughs) Um, yeah, I, I'm obsessed with Marlo. Like, I could she's watch great. her movement. Uh, she's just ridiculous. And I just did her floor flow teacher training in New York. Um, and it was, we did like, four days of just floor work. And it was, like, my brain exploded. It was amazing. Yeah. So, That's yeah. The cool about pool is, like, you can, you know, you've been doing it for 11 years. And it's still growing so much. And there's still always something new to do, whether, you know, once you kind of master the tricks, it seems like a lot of people are going to the movement and the floor movement mm-hmm. and really focusing and, you know, integrating the pole, but mm-hmm. it's like limitless. Yes, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. And so how would you like to see the pole community evolve over the next five years? Um, well, I mean, selfishly, you know, I want it to continue obviously growing because I want to continue having work. (laughs) Um, and for it to grow, um, you know, it needs to be more mainstream. Although like, I think on a personal, like sort of artistic level. And also I think coming from the world of S factor, um, like I, I, I'm conflicted about the sort of pole in the Olympics kind of thing. And I always have been, um, because for me, like pole is such an emotional journey and I don't think I will be able to ever separate it from the sort of emotional aspect. Um, so when I see, 
um, you know, the pole became so much too much like a sport. It kind of makes me sad a little bit. But but then again, it's good for um, mainstream acceptance and um, increasing uh, the number of people who actually do pole. So and it makes it accessible uh, for kids and stuff too. Yeah. In that, in that aspect, girl, I've had this struggle right. in my head, like woo, woo, and talking to people on, on this podcast has really helped like broaden my idea about it. And I think like, you know, exactly what you said, like the Olympus would be good to get exposure and for, you know, the people that, you know, that have issues with a child on a pole and they just can't yeah. imagine it. It's like, well, right. there would be an instance where if it splits in between pole dance and pole fitness or something like that, and that's their opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think there's definitely space for everyone. I mean, they, you know, and as, and you, you see fracturing off, like, um, I, I was listening to Elizabeth's podcast and she was talking about like, even within the sexy style of pole dancing, there's like so many branches of that. Um, there's a, a competition in Russia that's one of the exotic pole competitions. And I forget the, the different category names, but they have like the classic exotic division, which um, I was told by somebody who competed in it, who's Russian, that it's more of like the sort of American slash um, Australian style of sexy. Mm-hmm. And then they have um, uh, one that's like, hardcore exotic and it's like where the girls are doing like flips and fongies and heels and more like crazy crazy tricks but in heels and then they have the like flow exotic which is like Olga Koda like kind of Russian style that mixes you know some contemporary and break dance so like even within the world of like the sexy style pole dancing it's now splintered off into all these groups so like definitely like within pole there's so many different styles and it's kind of nice that you know, you can, you can find your niche in any one of these different types of styles. Yeah. So. That was Carmine Black's interview. If anyone wants to go back and listen to it, I think she was our second guest ever, but I mean, it's true. It's kind of like pole dance is not a genre. A pole mm-hmm. is something you dance on and around. Right. You know, the genre is what you make of the dance style. Mm-hmm. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, it's definitely headed in that way where it's just, cause then it's something for everyone, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, and we talk about, um, often that people seem less excited about the Olympic route, even though they think it'd be cool, but people seem to be really excited about the potential, maybe getting into the X games. Like, have you heard people talk oh, about that at all? No, but I've, I've always cool? thought, I've always thought it was perfect for the X yeah. games. Always. I don't know if someone is pushing it or is it just something we talk about a lot, but like, yeah. I feel like that is when someone first said that, I was like, that's brilliant because you yeah. can keep the heels, you can keep, mm-hmm. you know, this, like the movement and the sensuality, like you said. Mm-hmm. That yes, is what, keep the authenticity because yeah. that's what the X Games is all about is mm-hmm. authenticity. Yeah. So. Just in case you know someone that you can like. <laughs> Well, you know, Lindsay Kimura. Do you know Lindsay? No. She runs the, the pole. Uh, she runs PCS. Okay. The pole championship series. Okay. Um, and she used to be the marketing director at X pole us. Okay. So she used to work for, for the X games. And I remember having conversations with her years ago and being like, Lindsay, why isn't the yeah. X, why isn't pole in the X games? So she didn't have an answer. She didn't have an answer. <laughs> Maybe she should revisit it. I don't know. <laughs> and I'm learning so many people from you on this podcast. I thought that I was like a little pole world stocky, but you've just <laughs> opened a lot more doors of people I need to learn about. So thank you. <laughs> um, is there anything you have coming up that you want to share with our audience um, other than like the expert? Like and if you have a cat and you're a pole dancer, you got to get an expert, guys. <laughs> And the toys and the and the catnip spray and I'm really excited about this. Oh, thank you. Yeah, anything else um, you want to share? Well, I'm I'm leaving in November for Europe, so I'm doing another tour of Europe. I'm teaching um, in France and in uh, Switzerland and in Prague and in England and some other places. Um, so that's kind of my November. And then I have a couple of months where I'm at home just working on some personal business stuff. Um, I don't know. I, in terms of like something like really exciting coming down the line. I mean, expert for me is kind of the thing at the moment. Um, I need, I probably need to start competing again soon just to 
continue staying relevant and pushing myself. So um, I wouldn't mind doing a pole theater. Um, oh, yes, what, please. Yeah. I think what Maddie and Jimmy have done is so smart and yeah. so good for the pole industry. So they are such smart cookies. Yeah. Uh, and the pole yeah. world um, videos just started coming out last week. And I'm like, oh, my God, just take my afternoon away because I have to <laughs> watch all of these. People are super creative. Yeah. I've only seen a von Schmink, which like blew my mind. Mm-hmm. I love her so much. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I need to, that needs to be my homework today is to catch up on those videos. Yes, they yeah. were fantastic. People really went above and beyond. Like uh, Retchless one and his was amazing. But then, you know, how people integrated the video component. Yeah, like Christy Sellers. Oh my gosh, hers yeah. was super cool, you know? And so, and there were a few people that, that did the video component. So hers was like, the interactive but um mm. i'm gonna put her video in the show notes just because i was like yeah this is like next level you know keeping things interesting so yeah um yeah i would like to request to see you do a pole theater please okay all right <laughs> people would be happy yeah. before, you know, <laughs> before you settle down yeah yeah before the baby happens and i forgot to ask how do you do you just like handle all your own touring stuff or do you have a manager or something like that i have a manager yeah christy craig from pulls on tour tour, yeah Yeah, she she manages phoenix and sergia and heidi coker josiah like she manages a bunch of us yeah okay so there's a person out there that helps you do yes that just sounds overwhelming yeah thank god we could not do it on my own (laughs) Agree. I mean, I'm sure you're capable, but why would you want to do it on your own? Yeah, I've got better things to do with my time. Yeah, exactly. Um, So before I let you go, can you leave us with an empowering message or quote or anecdote or something to sign off with? Um, Yeah, um, there's there's this reoccurring. So it's kind of a mantra that I say to myself whenever I'm about to go on stage and perform um, because I get really, really nervous. And there's always, oh, always. And there's always that moment when I'm before, right before I'm about to go on stage where I tell myself like, you know, you don't have to do this. Like no one's forcing you to perform. Like if you don't want to perform, just walk off stage and tell them you don't feel well, you know, like, because I, you know, I get really, really nervous. So I, every time I'm in the back wings, I'm about to go on and I remind myself that it is such a blessing and such a gift that I am physically able, I'm able-bodied, I have full use of my arms and my legs and my mind and my body, that I can go on and do these things on the pole because there are some people out there who just wish that they could even like do one-eighth or one-twenty-fifth or whatever of what we as pole dancers do every single day. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really easy for us to take things for granted you know, especially when we're at the studio and we see an Instagram video and like, oh my God, I can't do this triple backflip, whatever, whatever, you know, like there are people who wish they could, they could even just walk across the studio floor on their own legs, you know, so it really puts things in perspective. So we're very blessed. Yeah, Yeah. I know we, we sometimes, you know, we think about the struggle or the stress or, you know, mm-hmm. obviously that just comes with a, a passion of any type, of but that's so smart to just sit back and say, <laughs> if this is the biggest stress in my life right now that, mm-hmm. <laughs> that I get to like perform a beautiful, yes. artistic, creative, sexy dance. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. that's yeah. a good problem to have. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, Thank you, Natasha. (laughs) You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it was so fun talking with you today. I appreciate everything you shared with us and everything you do for the pole community. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure being on your podcast. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Bye. All right. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Pole Parlor podcast. Want more? Visit poleparlor.com for show notes and to link to the Facebook group where you can connect with other poleaholics and continue the conversation. Listen to past episodes and subscribe to new episodes on the website, YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. Lots of love, babes. Thanks for listening.